So in this video, I'd like to have a look at representations of the god Dionysus in Greek art, just as I have done previously for the goddess Athena. Now, the first thing that probably springs to mind when I mention the god Dionysus is his association with being the god of wine. And this is certainly something that we see reflected in Greek art. So in a number of these images, he's seen holding a drinking cup, for example. So in that top left and top right, he's holding a two-handled drinking cup known as a cantharos. In the bottom right image, it's a whole drinking horn known as a rhytop. And when he's arriving at the wedding of Thetis and Peleus, the mother and father of Achilles, in that black and white image taken from the Francois bars, he's in fact taken an entire amphora or storage jar of wine to that particular wedding. So wine is very much at the forefront of these images. It's not just the drinking cups, however, or the storage jars of wine that link back to that role. We also have the fact that he is wearing a wreath on his head in many of these images, which associates him with a Greek drinking party known as the Symposium. And in the image at the bottom left, the god Hermes, the adult male, would have originally been holding grapes as well, not just to tease the baby Dionysus whom he is holding, but to remind us of the fact that this baby would grow up to become the god of wine. So the attributes of Dionysus very successfully placed him in this role. It's not just the attributes, however, the physical attributes, but his pose as well that does this. So in each of the images that I am showing you now, Dionysus is reclining on his left arm, just as a Greek male would have done at a symposium or drinking party. The idea being that all the males in the room, if reclining on their left arm on their couches, would have kept the conversation flowing around the room as opposed to just talking to the person next to them. And if you're interested in learning a bit more about a symposium, then the Warwick Classics Network has a very good video on this by Professor Michael Scott. Just to name check the images that we're looking at for you, we've got Dionysus reclining in the presence of Athena on the left hand side. We've got a section of the East pediment from the Parthenon in the middle, and we've got the famous Dionysus sailing on the ocean by Exequia on the right hand side. The third way he is associated with wine is through the people he appears with in art or his associates and notably his maenads and satyrs. So let's start with the maenads. Maenads are the females that you can see in these images. Maenad literally translates as maddened woman and they are the female worshippers of Dionysus. We don't have an awful lot of evidence for what happened during ritualistic worship of the god Dionysus. Uh, we do have some literature, for example, Euripides Bacchae, but we do get the impression that part of it was about ritualistic ecstasy, getting yourself into a state of ecstasy and leaving behind your normal self. This being done through singing and dancing, drinking wine, of course, but also hallucinogenics. And we have stories in literature of women whilst in this state ripping apart wild animals, probably referenced there in the hair that one of the main ads is holding up and handing towards Dionysus. We can see part of this ritualistic activity reflected in the main ad in the middle scene as well. She's in the middle of dancing, her head raised in that state of ecstasy, her mouth even open to show that she is singing. On the other hand, we have the satyrs. If you're familiar with the god Pan, you'll understand their appearance a little bit more because they're meant to be half man and half goat. And they are associated with insatiability. For a start, over women over sex. You can see that the satyr in that middle image is attempting to grope the maenad. And I think she's about to give him quite a whack with the staff or the thyrsus that she's holding in her hand. Quite often as well, they're shown with um, erect phalluses to also hint at the fact that they cannot control these particular urges. All of this is very much exotic to the Greeks. It goes against traditional Greek values of nothing in excess, of modesty, of control. So it's placing Dionysus and his worshippers in a bit of an outsider 
position. And it, and it certainly did attract outsiders and, and minorities to his particular um, type of worship. Satyrs as well can also just be seen in general revelry. They might be drinking, quite often they're playing musical instruments, flute or nose flute, or just generally having a great time. So this idea of Dionysus being outside of the main pantheon of gods is another theme that you can explore when you're talking about his representation in art. He's eventually brought in um, from about the time that the Dionysia becomes an important festival in Athens from the archaic period. Um, and eventually he's one of the options for the 12th member of the Olympians. But most of the time we see him in art on his own, isolated from the other Greek gods and goddesses. Um, I thought one of the best ways to show you this was to choose two scenes showing the wedding of Thetis and Peleus, on the left from the Francois vase and on the right from the Sophilos vase in the British Museum. Whilst all the other gods and goddesses arrive in their married pairings, all with like-minded gods or goddesses, so for example, Artemis is in a chariot with Athena on the Sophilos vase, in both scenes, Dionysus arrives on his own. His appearance also places him outside the main pantheon of gods. You can see in these images the long, more exotic hair. You know, obviously, we're, we're early on in Greek art here, but as kind of time goes on, Greeks do start to represent their own Greek appearance through short, curlier hair. And yet Dionysus retains the kind of long, loose, soft flowing hair. He's also associated with more, more exo exotic aspects rather, so for example the tiger skin around his neck reflecting the fact that he's brought the vine from India to Greece and of course I've mentioned previously all that behaviour of the Maenads and the satyrs during the ritualistic worship of him. Finally, you can also talk about Dionysus as a chthonic deity which is a way of discussing his associations with the underworld. It's not quite something that might first of all come to mind with Dionysus, but from kind of very early on in the Mycenaean period, he had that association with Hades, with the underworld. Um, where does this come from? Well, in mythology, Dionysus has some associations with rebirth. First of all, through his own birth. We've got a mortal mother, Semele, who Zeus has fallen in love with and seduced. Surprise, surprise. But she wanted to see Zeus in his true form. Very dangerous. Don't ask to see the Greek gods in their true form. And you can imagine what happened to her. Zeus has to take the baby Dionysus out of her womb and he places it in his own thigh. So in effect, Dionysus is reborn again, born twice, once from his mother and again from the thigh of Zeus. This is not the only story of rebirth. There's also one in which is much earlier story than the one with Semele, in which he is actually the son of Zeus and Persephone, and due to Hera's jealousy, is ritualistically ripped apart and has to be reborn. So this is where the associations come from. And we can see that there is a bit of a link to that still in Greek art, even centuries later in the archaic and classical periods. So, of course, I've talked about ritualistic behaviour and the ripping apart of animals and, and sometimes even um, individuals in Greek literature. So we can kind of link that in some ways with him being a chthonic deity. But the very best examples that I can use for you actually come from the Parthenon. But I should point out that these are theories associated with one particular scholar and they are dependent on the individuals being exactly who he thinks they are. And that scholar is David Stuttart. And what he says is on the east pediment of the Parthenon and the east section of the frieze, the gods are arranged in a particular way so that you have gods associated with the underworld on the left hand side and those associated with the upper world on the right hand side. And therefore, if you read the piece of art from left to right, you are experiencing a kind of rebirth or you're moving from darkness into light. And in those groupings, Dionysus is associated with the gods of the underworld in both cases. 
in the pediment, you can see Dionysus and then Stuttard believes Demeter and Persephone. Of course, their association there of Persephone living in the underworld for part of the year and also the Eleusinian mysteries. And then he believes that to be Hecate on the right hand side, goddess of witchcraft. On that section of the frieze we're looking at, we've got Hermes who takes the souls of the dead down to the underworld, then Dionysus, again then Demeter, and then to her right would be Ares, who as god of war sends count the souls down to Hades. So, as I've said, that is dependent on those individuals being whom David Suttard says they is. In fact, Nigel Spivey says we can't be certain. But if it were true, Dionysus is with the gods of the underworld, not with the gods of the upper world. Finally, I just wanted to bring up some particular scholarship that you might want to use uh, to integrate if this was to come up as a greater theme within the 30 mark. I previously just mentioned there David Stuttard's theory of associating Dionysus with Catholic deities. You could also make a case for Susan Woodford uh, about this quote being relevant. She says the change from black figure to red figure vases was revolutionary. And I actually think that you could use Exequias's Dionysus sailing on the ocean to disprove this. And the reasons why it's so revolutionary are provided by Michael Scott. It's a very interactive vase. The wine sloshing about is the sea that Dionysus is sailing in. But also the narrative of the vase with Dionysus reclining as though he were at a symposium, wearing a wreath, holding a right on, also reflects the fact that this Helix was a drinking cup in itself. 